Okay, great. Welcome everyone to the 2020 Champion of Equal Opportunity CEO Awards uh, virtual ceremony and panel discussion. Uh, I'm Robin Troutman. I'm the Deputy Director of the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. Just a couple of quick um, logistics notes. Number one is we will be um, recording this session and it will be made available to everyone after um, this session is over, most likely tomorrow. Um, we also are providing CART services, so if you would like to use closed captioning, if you go down to your bottom toolbar and click on captioning or CC, you can click on that and you will um, have the captioning made available to you. Again, we ask that everyone please keep your phones or computers on mute if you are not speaking. Um, and that way, when it is time for the people to speak, we will um, be able to hear everyone clearly. Also, for the sake of bandwidth and um, getting everything to, um, to be seen clearly, we ask that um, you put your videos also, um, uh, turn off your videos until it is your time if, if you are participating. And with that, I uh, want to kick it off to our CEO, Donna Meltzer. Thank you so much, Robin. Good afternoon, everybody, or morning, depending on where you might be. Um, I'm so excited today to host this Champions for Equal Opportunity Award ceremony to be followed, as Robin noted, by our self-advocacy panel. Um, this is a really a special event for NACDD. We look forward to this every year. Those of you who are typically at our annual conference know that it is a highlight of our annual conference. I'm so sorry that we cannot be together in person this year for this event. Um, unfortunately, as we all know, uh, the events of our country and, and our world at large um, keep us from being together. But we're doing the next best thing possible. And I'm so thrilled to see how many people have been able to join us today by video as we pay tribute to so many amazing advocates who are part of all of the work that NACDD does. So I'm grateful to all of you for joining and I'm grateful for your patience as we do work through some of the technical difficulties um, that were happening in advance and may of course happen as we go through today's uh, program. Um, as many of you know, NACDD has developed a wonderful partnership with a group called Optum. If you're not familiar with Optum, Optum is a company that helps modernize the health systems infrastructure, advances care and empowers people with disabilities as they take control of their own health care. They work with state and local government partners to make the healthcare system better for everyone, specializing in solutions for those with IDD and behavioral health needs, ensuring community involvement and person-centered supports. Optum is very fortunate to have on its team, Dan Oler, who is their Vice President for Business Development. In that role, among many other things, Dan works directly with state and local government leaders and leaders of national and state associations, just like NACDD, to find ways to help people with IDD get the best health and life outcomes and all of the services that they need to live independently. Optum, with support from Dan and Kelvin McCord, both of whom are with us today, continues to renew its commitment to working with NACDD on materials that support self-advocacy and peer-to-peer -peer training. Optum is also highly engaged in our DD Awareness Month activities and joined us last year live for the first time when we had a DD Awareness Fair on Capitol Hill, which we had planned to do again this year, but unfortunately the pandemic kept us from meeting in person. We continue to be very grateful to Optum for their vision and support as we move forward with several projects that really speak to our work as DD councils, building inclusive lives, in the community. Finally, and most relevant for today, Optum comes to support, Optum continues to support our self-advocate leadership circle. Optum is the sponsor of today's event where we will honor our self-advocate leadership circle members and induct our newest members into the circle. At this time, I would like to invite Dan Oler from Optum to share a few words with all of you. Dan? Thank you very much, Donna, um, and, and good morning and or good afternoon to all of you uh, that have joined this celebration today. Um, it's really been a pleasure for me to be involved with Donna and her team over the course of the last seven years. 
Um, I, quite frankly, I can't believe how fast that time has gone by. And I know that uh, many of you share that same sentiment. It seems like every year goes a bit faster than the one prior. Um, I certainly hope that all of you uh, appreciate the leadership uh, provided by Donna and her team uh, as an advocate on critical public policy issues um, and helping to ensure our nation's councils on developmental disabilities are equipped to be effective leaders in your respective states. Um, certainly for the rest of our lives, for the rest of our hopefully very long lives, uh, we are never going to forget 2020. Um, the, the advent of this third decade uh, in the 21st century has brought us a, a pandemic that has changed our lives in ways we never could have imagined. Uh, one of the things that I truly look forward to each and every summer is joining all of you um, for the annual conference and, and specifically participating in the Champions of the Equal Opportunity Award Ceremony. Um, as Donna said, it's really one of the high points of the conference every year. And I know that uh, it, it's one that brings with it a, a wide range of emotions, uh, you know, laughter and, and tears and, and great memories and, and great celebration. I know many of you are also disappointed that we weren't able to gather together in person this summer and, and hope that we can safely do that again a year from now, because the reality is a year from now is going to be here pretty quick. Um, just a couple of years ago, I had the honor of being up on the podium with Donna <clears throat> when NACD recognized Betty Williams for a lifetime of service and her courageous self-advocacy. Just a few months prior to that in the spring, I had been in the state of Indiana uh, where Betty was already a local legend. Uh, her never-ending smile and, and warm demeanor not to be mistaken for her fierce desire to advocate for the life that she wanted to live. Betty was truly a champion of equal opportunity. And of course, today, we have the honor of presenting the Betty Williams Champion of Equal Opportunity Award. Likewise, it was a short 13 months ago in the rain-soaked city of New Orleans when April Dunn was recognized for her accomplishments. And while April and Betty, for that matter, are deeply missed by all who knew them, uh, it was our collective uh, pleasure to honor her memory with today's presentation of the very first April Dunn Start Your Journey Award. Our team at Optum is blessed to have met both Betty and April and felt the impact of their work. Uh, on behalf of all of us at, at Optum, we congratulate the nominees for these two prestigious awards and salute each of you for your hard work, your dedication, and your passion. Uh, all, all of you are truly champions of equality. And we celebrate your accomplishments. I believe we have a, a responsibility, if not a duty, to cultivate and support the advocacy movement, all of us. At Optum, we're committed to engaging individuals in their own health care and to amplify their voices to help demonstrate self-advocacy throughout their lives. In my role, I travel across the country. <clears throat> well, I used to travel across the country. That was before COVID started. Uh, but, but I certainly hope to do that uh, again uh, and meet with individuals just like all of you. And so nice on this call. And it's hard to see all 90 of you all at once. But uh, I know I've seen Kristen Larson in, in Nebraska and Wanda Willis in Tennessee and cherished uh, the time I've had to spend uh, with you and many others. Uh, my job is to listen, to learn, to further understand how collectively we can build a system of supports that promotes independence and inclusion and helps people live healthier lives one person at a time. Uh, five years ago, I'm going to say five short years ago, back in 2015, uh, NACD and Optum uh, worked together to develop a self-advocacy ebook that's called The Art of Impact. And I hope that all of you have had a chance to, to see that, maybe even reference that at time. Um, we updated that a bit in 2017, and that work remains really important to all of us 
It provides an online tool for all individuals in their journey to self-advocate. Uh, more recently, we've been working with the NACD team on a peer support program um, that uh, we hope will continue to expand opportunities for individuals to be engaged in competitive employment, self-advocacy, and just overall greater life satisfaction. Um, a special thank you to everyone on this call that serves on their local council on developmental disabilities in your respective states and territories. Your leadership and the passion to influence and shape policy and service delivery systems helps bring forth meaningful change. We value your role uh, and we look forward to continuing to work with you in the days ahead. As I bring my comments to a close, uh, and it is not at all lost on me that if we were all gathered together, there would be great applause, as I say, as I bring my comments to a close. Um, it's important that we acknowledge a few key milestones that we're celebrating in 2020. Um, unfortunately, this pandemic has altered very much the way we do things. Uh, we cannot and must not allow it to prevent us from the celebration of significant achievements. The Developmental Disabilities Act was reauthorized to change the language of the law to include developmental disabilities. That legislation gave states broad responsibility for planning and implementing comprehensive services and authorized the creation of a Council on Developmental Disabilities in each state. 50 years later, and so I'm one of those people that can say, yeah, I remember that because I was here 50 years ago. Um, our IDD service systems are stronger, more inclusive. Resources are more abundant. Uh, the rebalancing of systems continues to evolve across the country. And quite frankly, self-advocacy is stronger than it's ever been. Councils on developmental disabilities have absolutely played a key role in those accomplishments, as has your national association at NACDD. There remains much work to do, and I believe in the next 50 years, there'll be continued evolution that will lead to even more opportunities and growth for inclusion. And while I'm not likely to be here 50 years from now, I suspect many of you that on this call will be uh, and could look back uh, with great pride at the accomplishments. We celebrate your accomplishments, all of you, the nominees, the award winners. We honor your commitment. We envy your passion. And we're very proud to be a partner of NACDD. Um, thank you so much for allowing up and the opportunity to share in this celebration. Um, I really look forward to seeing all of you uh, next summer. Uh, please stay safe uh, as we continue to live in the age of COVID. Uh, but also stay positive uh, and never stop advocating. Uh, congratulations to Corey, to Heidi, to Jessica, Jason, and Sydney for your induction into the Self-Advocacy Leadership Circle. Thank you so much for allowing us to share some time with you. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great and safe day. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate those very warm words and the congratulations to this year's outstanding advocates, those who are um, you know, carrying on this incredible work um, in the memories of both Betty and April. Um, and we're just thrilled that even though it's here on a screen that you are able to be here as always with us. Um, so much of this event and what we are able to do through NACDD to lift up the voices of people with lived experience and, and to promote great opportunities for self-advocacy has really grown out of the conversations we have had and the work that we continue uh, to do together and with support from Optum. So thank you for being with us today, Dan, as, as always. Um, instead of a, a lovely fancy hotel, we're like, you know, live in my living room. Um, hopefully next year, as you said, we will be in Washington, DC. We will be live again and, and everybody will be with us. Um, so I do want to take a moment. I am sure that there are some of you who have joined us today who are not very familiar. Um, we are self advocate leadership circle. So I just want to explain briefly what it is. Um, it was established in 2014 at the NACDD annual conference, and the purpose of the circle 
is to create an entry point for the many highly talented self-advocates identified by DD councils to become more involved in the work of NACDD. As a national organization, we want to be sure that the voice of those who live with IDD is included in every aspect of our work. All too often, we were finding ourselves creating committees and work groups and saying, hey, do we have self-advocates on that committee? Or do we have self-advocates serving on our board? And too often, it was really like the same three or four people who would come forward and, and volunteer to be involved. By establishing the circle, we know that we now have a ready group of individuals who are there to serve at every level of NACDD's work. Over the past several years, folks from the SALC have helped to write the Art of Impact, the, the self-advocacy tool that Dan mentioned earlier. Um, we have had folks serving on our public policy committee, our member services committee, on the committee which plans our annual conference, on our strategic planning committee and on our board of directors. Several of our self-advocates work with us to write grant opportunities and many participate in our self-advocacy committee. Um, just about every opportunity we have with NACDD includes self-advocates and that is by design. And that is of course, again, why we created this group so that we are certain that we never say nothing about, that we must always say nothing about us without us and that we can live up to that full potential so really we look at this self-advocate leadership circle not as a separate organization or a separate committee but it's a portal to serving in all of the meaningful roles at nacdd's work so i am so pleased today to be able to um, shout out the names of those who currently have been serving on the council and then welcome in our new members. So we have Kathy Bates from New Hampshire, Cynthia Bentley, Wisconsin, Shiloh Blackburn, Idaho, Christopher from Illinois, Adonis Brown, North Carolina, Cole Brown, Kansas, Ken Capone, Maryland, Stacy Christensen, Utah, Monica Cooper, Arizona, Brendan Darnell, Kansas, Morgan Davis, Oklahoma, Kathy Enfield, Missouri, uh, Corey Elmore, Alaska, Kelly Holt, Utah, Sandy Houghton, Massachusetts, Tina Jackson, Kentucky, Jennifer Carner, Oklahoma, Aaron Kaufman, Maryland, Sydney Krebsbeck, Alaska, Marissa Laus, Virginia, Russell Lehman, Nevada, Kathy Lee, Florida, Scott Lindblom, Arizona, William Lovell, Tennessee, Renee Manfredi, Hawaii, Santa Perez, Nevada, David Pino, Wisconsin, Arizona, Robbie Reedy, Minnesota, Trisha Perry, Ross Ryan, Oregon, Aaron Snyder, Wyoming, Eric Stewart, Utah, Lenny Dinko, Williams of Indiana, Williams, Massachusetts. So that's quite a list and it's growing every year. This year, we are very excited to induct some new members. They are Jason Gieschen of Nebraska, Sydney Kretak, Alaska. I heard earlier that was Sydney. Jessica Bitt of Nebraska and Heidi Williams of Alaska. So congratulations to all of you. And here's what I would like to say to each of you. We hereby induct you into our self-advocate leadership circle and ask that you take this role seriously and agree to work as part of your DD Council and or your greater community to enhance and improve all aspects of the NACDD agenda by ensuring that the voice and talents of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities is an equal part of all that we do. Congratulations to you all. We can't wait to see the great things you will be doing with us this year. Now, it is my honor and privilege to help bestow two awards that we call our Champions of Equal Opportunities or CEO Awards. The first award that we will present is named, as Dan had mentioned, in loving memory of our 2016 recipient of this award, Miss Betty Williams of Indiana. 
Betty was herself an amazing advocate, both Indiana and on the national scene. To help present this award today, I now call on Kristen Vandergriff, the Executive Director of the Alaska DD Council. Kristen? Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the Betty Williams Champions of Equal Opportunity Award winner, Heidi Lee Williams. Heidi is currently the Vice Chair of our Alaska Developmental Disability Council. She also serves as the Chair of our Autism Ad Hoc Committee. She is active in other council committees, including our Developmental Disabilities Committee, and serves on the Stone Soup Group Parent Conference and Disability Pride Planning Committees. She helped craft the Autism Proclamation for Alaska in 2019 and the Anchorage Autism Proclamation in 2020 for Alaska's largest city. She has been a lifelong advocate for individuals with disabilities, especially working to empower other self-advocates with autism. Heidi was a strong advocate in the passage of the Supported Decision-Making Agreements Act in Alaska, bringing her important lived experience as both an individual with disabilities and a parent of children with disabilities. Heidi owns her own business, Puzzled with Purpose, Autistically Inspired Creations, and has presented nationally at OcaliCon, as well as across the state at such conferences as the Alaska State Special Education Conference, the Stone Soup Group Statewide Parent Conference, Full Lives Conference for Direct Support Professionals, the Alaska Autism Society Conference, Disability Pride Celebrations, and many others. She is an artist who paints, draws, quilts, sews, and knits, who founded the Shining Abilities Craft Fair featuring artists with disabilities. She is an author and was even crowned Alaska State Fair Duchess this past year and successfully advocated the creation of a possibility day for the Alaska State Fair for the special needs community. Heidi is a very passionate advocate who enjoys testifying for bills, meeting with legislators, and is the recipient of the 2018 Arc of Anchorage Community Award and the 2019 Alaska State Fair Community Service Medal. Heidi is a strong advocate for people with disabilities and has made a tremendous impact in her community, empowering many. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Heidi to say a few words. Hi, I'm not sure if anybody can see me or hear me right at the moment. Well, I'm extremely honored, shocked, and thankful to receive this award. I want to first thank the Lord for opening the doors for me and bringing people in my life that have helped me break barriers, believed in me, taught me, and shown me that God can use me to be a shining light for others. To be a champion for something is to be passionate about doing the right thing making this world a better place through advocating, defending, encouraging, promoting, fighting for, sticking up for, and supporting. As a leader, you champion the opportunity to help others. People with disabilities are the best source of information on what to advocate for. And through advocating, getting to choose and live meaningful lives as defined by their choices. We all have a spectrum of hopes, dreams, and abilities and talents. And overcoming obstacles enables achievements of potential no one may have thought possible, giving hope for a future. The journey supports development and mentoring opens doors to endless possibilities. Each journey begins with a single step. You can dream bigger with taking one step at a time. Connecting pieces helps us to fly and soar higher, making the unimaginable possible. God has made each of us with a purpose and sharing our experiences, knowledge, and your testimony can help others along their journey. Possibilities once unimaginable can be achieved with a purpose and amazing outcomes. I have the heart that wants to just simply connect purposeful pieces 
that can make a difference. I believe dreams and goals continue throughout each person's journey. With the things Kristen mentioned about me earlier, I am also a mother of two and a Grammy to two handsome grandsons. I love writing, directing, and acting, which has led me to working on finishing an autism-based children's book and a short film about autism. My next journey is to serve as the 2020 National Heart of America Elite Miss Alaska with autism as my platform. Using our voices and actions to empower inclusiveness, opportunities, and equality. I am excited to continue to learn, lead, and advocate for Alaskans with disabilities, their families, and communities, as well as advocating all over the United States to give people the opportunities to lead purposeful and meaningful lives. There's a saying that I say a lot, and that is that each of us are like Alaskan snowflakes, unique in our own way. But when it hits the ground, you make quite an impact on everyone around you. I know that because of the work that Corey, Sydney, and I, and many other advocates have done, there's been a huge impact in the lives of many Alaskans. And thank you guys all again for this huge honor. Oh, and I wanted to show, I did get my award, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Heidi, it's beautiful, and I want to congratulate you on, on behalf of all of NACDD, and we are so excited to see um, what you will continue to do, both on behalf of yourself, for others in your home state, and of course across the country as well. We're very proud. Um, I do um, have a couple of letters that you have received that I would like to share. Um, I know that they've been sent directly to you, but I'd like everybody to know um, that Heidi received a couple of letters from some very important people uh, back in her home state of Alaska, and let me quickly read them. The first reads, Dear Heidi, congratulations on being awarded the Betty Williams Champion of Equal Opportunity Award from the NACDD for being a seasoned advocate that is well known on a national scale for your advocacy work. You should feel proud of this great honor. I am glad that Alaska has such capable and ambitious people such as you who provide an excellent example to fellow Alaskans. You have worked very hard while testifying at legislative hearings, mentoring other advocates, speaking at conferences, and creating unique events for those with disabilities. Such virtues must be promoted within our state, and we are thankful for your determination. Again, please accept my congratulations and best wishes on working as a self-advocate for individuals with disabilities. Sincerely, Congressman Don Young. Wow. The second, the second letter reads, Dear Heidi, please accept my heartfelt congratulations for receiving the Betty Williams Champion of Equal Opportunity Award from the NACDD. This award recognizes your exemplary achievements and commitment to serving Alaskans living with developmental disabilities. I believe Alaska, because of people like you, is a role model for the rest of the country for our exceptional special education and sports programs, inclusivity and support for families. Keep up the great work, Heidi, and please don't hesitate to reach out if I can ever be of assistance. Sincerely, Senator Dan Sullivan. And last, dear Heidi, congratulations on receiving the 2020 Betty Williams Champion of Equal Opportunity Award from the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. This prestigious award is a testament to the respect and appreciation you have earned for your dedication to advocating for people with disabilities at the state and federal levels. Your hard work has not gone unnoticed and is greatly appreciated. Your contributions are one of the many reasons Alaska is such a wonderful place to live and raise a family. Thank you for all that you do on behalf of our community and our state. Keep up the great work. Sincerely, Senator Lisa Markowski. So uh, Heidi, I, I think you have uh, 
attracted great notice in your state. And I think that your senators and your member of Congress are along with all of us expecting to see more great things come from you. You have done your state proud and we are also very proud of what you have done. So before uh, we close out on your award, we have some very special advice for you um, that is going to be shared by Max Barrows. Max received this award at our conference last year on that uh, rainy day in New Orleans, Louisiana. So um, Max, if I could ask you to share your thoughts with Heidi at this time. Yes, I can. Um, so I'm honored um, that you received uh, this award. Um, your contributions to strengthen the self-advocacy movement means a lot to your peers across the country. You are an amazing role model and a great example of how to make a difference in the world. Please make sure to let others know about your accomplishments share with them that you were chosen to receive this award and take the time to tell us all what you have done as a leader. I hope to get to spend time with you and meet you sometime in the future, maybe at the next National Self-Advocacy Conference. Congratulations, Heidi, you well-deserved. Thank you so much, Max, for those great words. We appreciate that. And I know Heidi appreciates that. And Heidi, it's so great to have you with us today. Um, as you heard before, if we are in person next year, we will gladly welcome you back up uh, so that you can join us again in person. And congratulations. Before I move on to our next award presentation, I do want to note somebody was left off of the list that I read uh, for our self-advocate leadership circle. I do apologize about that, but we want to make sure that we have fully included Kristen Herbert of Idaho. Kristen, if you're on with us today, my sincere apologies. And uh, we have taken notice of your work as part of our SALC. So now our next award, our second award is called the April Dunn Start Your Journey CEO Award. Many of you will recall, as, as uh, Dan mentioned, that last year in, in her hometown of New Orleans, we presented this award to April Dunn, who was serving as the council chair of the Louisiana DD Council and was also an employee of Governor John Bell Edwards. April was an active and enthusiastic advocate and considered herself blessed to be doing the work that she so loved to do. Tragically, as we noted, April contracted COVID-19 while out doing her work in Louisiana and the virus took her life back in late March. Thus, we have named the Start Your Journey Award in April's memory, knowing the future rep recipients will continue their journeys in her memory. So I would now at this time like to ask Kristen Larson, the Executive Director of the Nebraska DD Council, to share some words um, in honoring Jessica Barrett. Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kristen Larson. Yes, another Kristen in the bunch. And I am the Executive Director of the Nebraska Council on Developmental Disabilities. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Jessica Barrett. Jessica is a promising young self-advocate who is also a member of the Nebraska DD Council. She is friendly, enthusiastic, and a determined young woman who demonstrates servant leadership in many integrated settings. Jessica helps and represents people with disabilities from the very rural and western frontier areas of Nebraska. Our state is 500 miles from east to west and to participate in our council meetings and activities in person, Jessica must travel more than seven hours one way from her hometown near the Nebraska-Wyoming uh, border. When she's home, she engages in many advocacy opportunities. As a school student, Jessica successfully navigated and advocated advocated for herself within the special education system. After high school, she attended LifeLink at the local college. Through LifeLink, uh, Jessica learned of the Nebraska Youth Leadership Council, or NYLC. She applied and was accepted to serve on NYLC and did so until she aged out. She credits NYLC with helping her learn to better advocate for herself, making many friends, and giving more presentations. NYLC led to her connection and her 2015 appointment to the Nebraska DD Council. She has served as the uh, DD Council Secretary for three terms from 2016 to 2019. 
Jessica is also a dedicated member of the People First of Nebraska's State Board. People First of Nebraska is Nebraska's only state organization run by and for people with disabilities. This past February, People First of Nebraska hired Jessica to be a paid disability policy specialist. In this role, she learned about policy advocacy, promoting good legislative action in our state legislature, and supporting others with disabilities to advocate for change. She developed and delivered presentations for the People First of Nebraska Policy Advocacy Day and attended the ARC of Nebraska's annual senatorial appreciation dinner. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she pivoted her work to develop videos and social media messages to educate others how to stay physically and mentally healthy. As a graduate of Leadership Scott's Bluff, a competitive and prestigious leadership development program that she had to apply for and be selected for, she enhanced her leadership skills and has made additional community connections. We're showing some photos now from the things I've been talking about. And some of the photos are uh, highlighting her community involvement in theater and college choir groups. She even traveled to New York City with one of her choir groups. She's crewing there on a hot air balloon at the Old West Balloon Fest and there's photos featuring her connection to her faith community. Uh, there she is with Nebraska, the leadership Scott's Bluff with Governor Ricketts. Um, you know, this friendly gal knows how to make connections. and I know she'll look forward to meeting many of you in Washington, D.C. next year. There's going to be a few photos showing here with Miss Wheelchair Nebraska, Miss Old West Balloon Fest, and with Courtney Miller, who used to serve as Nebraska's Development Disabilities Division Director and was on the council with Jessica. Miss Miller is now serving at a federal level for CMS and Jessica misses her. I would now like to share a video collection from a variety of people who know Jessica well and the positive influence she's had on her community. I think these videos from the different leaders and mentors in her life will paint a lovely picture of her unique personality, but due to time constraints, we were unable to include all of the video messages for the awards ceremony, but those additional videos will be, uh, have been put together in a complete video set as a gift for Jessica. And we will also be posting that complete video on the Nebraska Council website. And I thank all of you for those contributions. So now I'll pause and we'll show the videos. My name is Dave Curtis. I'm the mayor of Mitchell, Nebraska. I just want to take a minute and just congratulate Jessica Barrett for winning the National Self Advocate Award. I've known Jessica for quite a few years and she's always had a love for people. She's always willing to give her time, her talents, and her resources. And we just appreciate what she does. The strength of every community is people that want to get involved and help other people. And Jessica really shows that spirit. Which once again, we just want to thank her for this, this achieving this award. Hi, my name is Christy Burst. I'm the executive director of the Epilepsy Foundation, Nebraska and South Dakota chapters. And it is truly my honor to get to say a few words and congratulate Jessica on her this well-deserved award today. Um, I got to know Jessica in a previous role several years ago when I was the facilitator of the Nebraska Youth Leadership Council. Jessica was a member of our very first Western Nebraska Council, um, and she came in with this optimism to learn these new leadership and self-advocacy skills that was truly remarkable. Um, when she first came in, I remember her being kind of soft-spoken, but with this big, bright smile and this amazingly profound vulnerability that she was able to share with us, which we all learned from. Um, to open oneself up and be vulnerable and share sometimes painful experiences with the kind of hope and optimism and drive that she continues to have um, is something that we can all learn from. I'm so uh, proud of you, Jess, for continuing this self-advocacy journey, for being an advocate for others. Um, what you're doing is truly amazing, and I really do believe this is only the beginning um, of a very long advocacy journey for you. Congratulations. I hope you're taking the time to enjoy uh, this moment. It's well-deserved. Keep up the amazing work, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for you. Congratulations. Let's start. Hi, I'm Mary Angus. I'm the self-advocacy faculty for the Monroe Meyer Institute LEND program. One of my responsibilities is to train a public policy specialist for People First of Nebraska. 
I first met Jessica a couple of years ago at another training. I liked her from the start. I saw her again at the Pu People First of Nebraska conference last fall, and I was impressed by her growth. She was engaging and exuberant, uh, so much so that I wanted to talk to her about becoming a public policy specialist. Kelly and I spoke, and when we first broached the topic with her and asked her if she'd be interested in applying, she was so excited she answered yes before we finished the, the question. Okay, she has been just a wonderful asset. Hi, I'm Kelly Ellerbush. I'm the People First of Nebraska State Coordinator. Um, and Jessica had never worked um, in, at, in policy advocacy before, but she was determined to show others from rural areas that are far removed from our state capital that they could have a voice with elected officials as well. When COVID-19 hit, um, Jessica had been a disability policy specialist for less than a month and our state legislature adjourned. And Jessica was able to pivot her advocacy work to provide information to people with disabilities about what the coronavirus was and how they could stay healthy. Um, Jessica has also worked with our Nebraska ADA 30 year anniversary celebration committee by developing artwork um, that helped us promote our online virtual celebration. Jessica is always ready to try new tasks, develop new skills, and meet new challenges. She is a shining star out on the grass plains of Nebraska and is soon becoming a very important voice in, the, in, in our national disability community. So much so that her senator, Senator Stinner, introduced LR-462, which is going on the floor today. That was introduced to congratulate Jessica on receiving the 2020 April Dunn Start Your Journey Award and to recognize her, her leadership with regards to people with developmental disabilities. Congratulations, Jessica. Congratulations, Jessica. Congratulations. You deserve every bit of it. Bye. Hello, my name is George Slaughter, and I'm honored to tell you a little bit about Jessica Barrett and why she's so deserving of the April Dunn Start Your Journey Award. I've had the opportunity to work with Jessica in a number of different capacities over the years. First, as her principal at LifeLink Nebraska, which is an ESU school in Scotts Bluff. As her principal, I got to see how much Jessica enjoyed classes in art, photography, and choir while she attended Western Nebraska Community College. She even got to go on a trip to New York where she sang in Carnegie Hall. Jessica is very active in her community. She's a trained weather spotter, a member of the Fire Corps and Disaster Force, a volunteer at the Nebraska Wildland Fire Academy, and she even played the part of Rapunzel at the annual Scottsbluff Riverside Zoo Spectacular event. She's a former Sunday school teacher and has found her church home where she was recently baptized. Jessica has also participated in Leadership Scotts Bluff when I was president. As a graduate of Leadership Scotts Bluff, she learned leadership skills to become a better advocate, and she also made many community connections. Congratulations, Jessica, on your award, and we look forward to your continued community involvement and advocacy. A lot of people think of leadership as being out in front, being the face of a movement, and starting something, and doing so many different things that makes you the face of that particular movement or initiative. However, I think leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that that impact lasts in your absence. Jessica, you've done exactly that. You've been an advocate and a champion for so many people within the state of Nebraska and in the broader community. Well, as you, as you can see, others and I consider Jessica a shining star out on the grass plains of Nebraska. Without further ado, I would like to present Jessica Barrett, the 2020 April Dunn Start Your Journey recipient. Jessica?
I know she's there. She's in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska at the ESC there celebrating with others. I'm hoping that she'll, sh there she is. So Jessica, can you have them unmute and say a few words? I'm trying to unmute it for her, but it's not working. <laughs> Oh boy. We can see you. Oh, oh maybe there you go. Here. Hello. Can you hear us now? No. Here we go. You're going to yes. talk through here. We can okay. hear you. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, there we okay, go. Okay, good. Hi. <laughs> I, I just want to say thank you for giving me this award. It means a lot, and I can't wait to see where it takes me next. That's all I got. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you have your award there, too, right, Jessica? Yeah, sure uh, and you've been featured in a few, uh, the local newspaper yeah, and a few other things. 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 Governor Ricketts just sent you a letter today, too, I know, so... Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations, Jessica. Um, it was so great to see these videos and testimonials about you. And I think that helped all of us today to feel like we know you a little bit. Um, and you've done some amazing work. In addition to that letter that um, Kristen just mentioned from Senator Ricketts, we have a few others that have been sent to you as well. We um, Let me read these uh, two letters that I have with me. Um, the first one says, Dear Jessica, congratulations on receiving the April Dunn Start Your Journey Award. As historian Alexis de Tocqueville once remarked, the health of a democratic society may be measured by the quality of functions performed by private citizens. We thank you for your many acts of service, which have improved the lives of Nebraskans in your community and throughout our great state. We are grateful for the dedicated, civic-minded example you set for all of us. Keep working to make Nebraska proud. Sincerely, Senator Ben Sass. And we have this letter, very short one, but important. Dear Jessica, congratulations on receiving the April Dunn Start Your Journey Award. Well done. Congressman Adrian Smith. In addition to those, we know that Senator Fisher from your state is, has prepared a letter and that it is being sent directly to you. Um, before we close out this part, I think that we also have somebody who would like to share a couple words of wisdom uh, with you. And so I call upon Scott Lindblom, uh, a previous recipient of this award, to share a couple thoughts. Scott, are you ready? I, this this is Robin. I don't see his name anymore, so he might have may have gotten disconnected. But let me see if I we we can continue and let me see if I can find him. We will continue, and then uh, if Scott rejoins, we will we will come back to that. So um, this uh, really closes out this portion of uh, our our session today. Again, I want to thank both of or congratulate both of our uh, awardees. Heidi and Jessica, and thank you guys again for uh, all that you do on behalf of your states and, and so many others whose lives you greatly impact. You really are doing incredible work to change communities. Oh. And again, thanks to um, uh, Corey for his great work and being nominated again this year to Jason and Sydney and so many others. Um, just amazing work. Thank you. Um, Robin, any sighting of Scott before we move on to our panel? Hello, I'm here. Oh, Scott's you here. Me? Fantastic. Scott, what do you have to, to share with us? I would tell Jessica to thank you for my hometown, Scott Brook and Gary and Braska. Um, I know Adrian Smith about eight years. He used to go to my church. And I know John Steiner, Senate from Scott Brook, and I know Lynn. JB uh, commissioner, and I know a lot of people there. And um, 
I've been told Jessica, you are doing a great job in Scott Bluff, Gary, hoping, hoping you could be next level work with Commissioner Amoral. Amoral is next a Wyoming voter and they might need more opportunity as is and I appreciate it what Jessica doing all her work in Scott Club Gary and I'm hoping she could keep doing it. And I miss Alaska. I miss Scott Club Gary. Um I used to be on Fundamental Disability Advisor Committee with Tyler Watson, Joey Freema, and I used to be on advocacy with Department of Human Service, and I started transportation up there with by myself with my advocacy, and I got it done for Alaska community, and they're doing a good job doing such a bus. So I'm hoping Jessica will do the next level be a self advocacy stars. And I'm doing the same thing. And Jessica, I will help you be a role model for you. So congratulations from Scott for Gary. And I'm glad Braska and Arizona are there together. I want to thank for National Social DDD to doing that. Thank you all. You guys are doing hard work from Scott Lynn Bloom from Arizona. Scott, thank you so much for sharing those really important words of, of advice and congratulations to Jessica and making those great connections about your time uh, spent in Nebraska as well. So great to have you with us. So that yep. concludes our awards ceremony. And at this point, we are going to shift gears a little bit and move into our panel discussion with uh, several of our amazing self-advocates from our network. Um, our panel today is being moderated by Erin Kaufman. Erin is from the great state of Maryland, my home state. Um, if you don't know Erin, um, he is the Senior Legislative Associate at the Jewish Federations of North America, where he conducts their advocacy agenda. Um, Erin is a former member of NACDD's Board of Directors and currently serves on our nominating committee. He's a former vice chair and member of the Maryland Council on DD and is a self-advocate himself. And so I am now going to turn this over uh, to Erin, who will introduce our panel and get us started on a great conversation for the rest of our time today. Thank you. Welcome, Erin. Thank you, Donna. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Well, Donna, my dear friend, I must have forgotten your birthday or something. If you're going to make me follow Jessica and Heidi, I mean, I'll, <laughs> I'll make sure to put your birthday on my calendar because I have an impossible task. But I think the I thank the two of you who have stuck around for the next hour because we have such a tremendous panel, and as a person with cerebral palsy. Uh, I, I bleed Council Blue and I'm just so honored to be moderating this esteemed panel. With us from the land of Ben and Jerry, we have Max Burroughs. Max is uh, the director of, I'm just going to get my paper so I don't butcher anything. He's the director of outreach for uh, Green Mountain Self Advocacy. And he lives in rural Vermont, and he is the 2019 recipient of NACD's Betty Williams CEO Award. Uh, and we have with us from Hotlanta today, Kate Brody, who is uh, the Deputy Director at the Georgia Media Council. And she uh, lives with her wife and two children. And Manny is the, uh, Emmanuel, who goes by Manny, is the uh, administrative specialist at the Delaware City Council, but he also uh, has his own self-advocacy uh, self organization because he's not busy enough. And, uh, and he also uh, has a wife and a teenager, so you can send him your condolences later. Uh, and then I want to talk about Renee. She serves on the DD Council in Hawaii and she also is um, she also 
that is involved with the Shrine version of the Everest so they have people with disabilities, and it serves as the Special Olympics athlete representative for the board of Special Olympics Hawaii, and we thank her for getting up early with us today. Um, so I want to just get this party started, but I first want to say how uh, how wonderful, I, uh, how, what an honor it is to know Donna Meltzer. She's a giant in the facility field, and she has been since her time at the Epilepsy Foundation. The whole team, Robin, my dear friend Angela Steele, that's from the my early D council day. So it's just a thrill to be here with uh, such an amazing town for such an amazing organization. And also a great grateful to my friend Wanda Willis who's listening. So um, excuse me. I'm sorry, Aaron, your microphone is a is a little off. If you I don't know if you can just make an adjustment. It's uh, a little scratchy. Okay, I don't know what I can do, Robin, but, uh, but that sounds better. It, Whatever you did, I think that was it. Okay, so let's get this party started, and we will begin the first question with uh, Manny. Uh, and Manny, my question, and it's going to go to all of you after this, is um, tell me about your background and how you came to work with the DD Council. Um, and I, what I'm really curious about is did someone or something inspire you to become a good self-advocate like you are? Um, sure. Um, first, thank you for that great introduction of, of everyone. And it's such a privilege to be on such an esteemed panel uh, with such great people. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, my advocacy journey, uh, when I was about, I was in my teens, um, and there was a gentleman by uh, the name of Steve. Steve would, uh, every time Steve saw me, he said, Hey, Manny, you need to take part in this program called Partners in Policy Making. And I, I burst Steve off for years. Uh, every time I would see Steve coming, I would go in the opposite direction. Uh, and then eventually, um, I was sitting home one, uh, one, uh, one day, and I wasn't really doing much. And I said, uh, I said, you know, I need to do something besides working. I worked in retail at the time, and and so I got the opportunity to apply for the Partners in Policy Making program, and I applied for it with the intention that I wouldn't get in. Um, but boy, was I wrong. Um, so I, I applied, I got in, and um, that's when I first discovered um, the uh, Delaware Development and Disabilities Council. I grew up in Delaware, so I didn't really, I grew up in Delaware, but I didn't know the council existed. Um, so, so once I, once I started, uh, the Partners in Policy Making program, that's when my whole world really opened up. I was always an advocate for myself and, and, and that aspect, but the, uh, being part of this program really showed me how much I didn't know about how much I could make a change uh, by going through this program. And I went through the program, uh, and then at that time, uh, shortly after that was over, I, I, I was appointed to the, uh, I was actually appointed to the council before Partners was over. Uh, and then the, uh, my final project for Partners turned into my uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, so that's really where my my journey began, and I'm looking forward to the next years of my life to continue this thing. Manny Jenkins, thank you so much. And now let's take a long journey and go to Hawaii and speak to our friend and colleague, Renee Manfrey. Renee, the same question to you. Tell us a little bit about your Tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be a member of the DD Council in Hawaii. And tell us also if someone inspired you to be, someone or something inspired you to be a, a good, a strong self-advocate. Well, aloha and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. 
My name is Renee Manfredi. I am a member of the Developmental Disabilities Council for the state of Hawaii, a self-advocate and Special Olympics Hawaii athlete. I also work for, in the uh, Special Olympics Hawaii state office. Up until, and that's a really excellent question, Erin. Up until five years ago, I was not really familiar with what self-advocacy was or the DD Council until I met our program specialist from the DD Council at a Toastmasters meeting. From there, I learned what self-advocacy was and I took on leadership roles for the Hawaii Self-Advocacy Advisory Council. As I worked more with the staff from the DD Council, I was impressed to see these people dedicating their time on, on behalf of persons with IDD. Through the support of Tammy and Dangie Bartoldus, the current executive administrator, and Waynette Cabral, our former executive administrator, in my advocacy journey, I felt like I wanted to be an advocate for others who struggled just like I did. So I took on leadership roles, such as being the president of the Self-Advocacy Advisory Council and taking a seat on the Developmental Disabilities Council and offering suggestions and my concerns on behalf of individuals with IDD. That is basically my journey, which is still ongoing. Thank you for that question. And thank you so much for this opportunity to be a part of this incredible panel. It's an honor to be here. And congratulations to Heidi and Jessica for your awards. They are well-deserved. It's an honor to be here with you, uh, with you today, uh, Renee, so thank you. Now we'll turn to Max. Uh, Max, tell us a little bit about how Green Mountain uh, works with DD councils. I mean, your organization is renowned, but if you could just go into that a little bit and also talk about um, what inspired you to become a self-advocate? Was it just something in your heart or somebody that encouraged you or something that you saw or what was it? Well, first I want to say um, uh, thanks for this opportunity to speak on the self-advocacy panel. Um, and let me begin with thanking the Vermont DD Council of Developmental Disabilities Council for supporting me personally over the 13, past 13 years as I grew up into my role as um, an advocate and also for 25 years of support for Green Mountain Self-Advocates. Um, so in Vermont, we do a lot of typical collaboration activities with our DD Council. For example, together we work to get people interested and ready to connect with their legislators. We work as a team. We rely on the DD Council staff to closely follow the issues and explain complicated laws and policies to us. Uh, we then use uh, this vital information to come up with talking points in plain language. And with the financial support of the council, we work with peer leaders uh, of local groups to prepare self-advocates to speak up to their local representatives in the legislature. Um, a highlight of our collaboration is running a three weekend leadership training series for parents and self-advocates. The DD council truly respects us as equal partners. Um, the participants see how we work together as a team. The DD Council models how to support self-advocates to take charge. And whether it is presenting, facilitating small group discussions, making sure everyone has a chance to be heard, deciding where to hold the training or picking out the food, which, you know, is a good thing. Um, the DD Council involves us every step along the way. Uh, we feel valued as professionals. Now my job um, as outreach director is funded by the DD Council and they know that the heart and soul of Green Mountain Self Advocates is found in our 23 local groups here in Vermont that make up our organization. And by funding my job, the DD Council clearly shows um, they recognize the importance of the peer-to-peer -peer connection. For example, each year I spend one day a month working with students from five different high schools who are preparing to graduate. And a good amount of them are new Americans. And I'm optimistic for their future as leaders. I see them dig into their hard work of getting uh, the courage to speak up 
uh, for themselves. Um, being a peer mentor enhances my skills as a leader, and I'm honored to do this work on behalf of the Vermont DD Council. Um, and I see my journey um, to become an advocate as ongoing. To be honest, I have a strong voice, but even after 13 years of doing this work, I still struggle with the desire to avoid conflict. And being an advocate can put me in situations where people have different opinions. I have to remind myself that uh, part of being a leader is I have to strive to be comfortable in situations that can feel very uncomfortable at times. Thank you so much. And we'll conclude this question by going uh, to Kate Brady in Atlanta. Kate, I'm particularly interested in your response because like Manny, you decided not only to make uh, adv disability advocacy your passion, but working at a council is how you make your living also. So uh, I wonder what your thoughts were on this question. Thanks, Erin, and thanks NACDD for having me. Uh, it's great to get to meet the other folks on this panel. Uh, meeting Max feels like meeting a celebrity because in Georgia we are uh, following the work of uh, Green Mountain and uh, just benefiting from learning a ton from you all. So I wanted to start there. And uh, you're right, Erin, I think I, um, I have earned my living um, working in uh, disability employment and policy for almost 20 years. And um, so even the identity of being a self-advocate is a little bit of like a different hat. Um, but I loved your questions. And what I realized is that for me, arriving at the DD Council is kind of a full circle. I think I was a a very feisty, vocal, kind of justice-minded little kid in a wheelchair um, who had really big, ever-present ideas about my want to be included and to have friends. And I had a family that was very supportive of me taking risks and um, being mainstreamed, right? Um, which wasn't so common back then. And I think that framed up my work. Um, I'm formally trained as an organizational and community psychologist. And so I kind of fell into this work when a friend, a mentor of mine, Doug Crandall, hired me to run an employment project uh, across the state uh, for folks who were uh, returning to work from having been institutionalized either because of developmental disabilities or behavioral health labels. And that work really helps me understand the complex web of uh, policy and practice and the provider network and the role of individuals and families. And um, I moved from there to working at our state DD agency, which was more of a policy role. And and then to our uh, state VR agency and, uh, and ran uh, developmental disability services there and then got the honor of becoming the de deputy director at GCDD um, where we have a wonderful team. And for me, that is the perfect opportunity, right? As kind of the council as a sort of unifying force as I see it, right? Where we get to be a grant maker, we get to lead on legislative policy, uh, and we get to support self-advocacy in really meaningful and depthful ways. So for me, it's the, the perfect landing place, and I credit so many people along the way for recognizing um, my strengths or giving me a chance um, and letting me learn from them. And um, yeah, thanks. I'll stop there. Well, you, it seems like you've done everything in the state of Georgia and the people of Georgia are much better for it. So this next question is, we're gonna start with Renee. Renee, what do you think the number one misconception is of people with disabilities? And do you think your participation as an advocate has helped change some people's perceptions about people with disabilities and their capabilities? 
thank you for asking me that question. Can you uh, kind of repeat? Okay, so an answer to your question, I think the one concept misconception that people have with disabilities is they think that we're not smart. They think we are content with the circumstances we may be in because we do not know how to advocate the same as, as others. We are not heard. We may need help. They think we are oblivious and we are not paying attention. For me, because I was slower and got confused easily, they thought I had nothing to contribute. Um, as to the answer to the other question, I think that when people with IDD are given the chance to express their concerns, ideas, hopes, and dreams, per perceptions change. For the first time, people are actually listening to what I have to say and seeing that just because I have a disability doesn't mean I don't have something to contribute. I think that my participation on various committees, councils, and organizations has helped people have a better understanding of my disability and people with disabilities and that people with disabilities are a valuable asset in the conversation. My advocacy has shown me we all have the abilities and we can make our own decisions. I think it's changed how people view inclusion. And Kate, is, uh, that was very interesting and awesome. Thank you. Kate, my question is, is that Renee talked a lot about um, once people are exposed to her and see her many talents, their views tend to change about people with disabilities. Have you had similar experiences to Renee? And what do you think is the most uh, number one misconception, most common misconception? And do you think people getting to know you uh, has uh, demystified disability a little bit? Huh. Yeah, Erin and uh, Renee, I think you're on to something. Uh, we must have all been on the same wavelength when we were thinking about the answer. I do. I think. Um, I think in some ways I've led, led a sort of charmed life in that um, when you work in the disability field, you're met with people who get it, right? And if they don't, they're on that path already. I think, um, I think in other environments, some of those, those old ideas persist still a, a medical model at, at worst and a kind of sympathy pity model at best. And I think, the best and maybe only real medicine for that is relationship, right? And exposure and relationship. Um, and then I think the only other thing I'd add is that I think our experience of disability is probably complicated by our other identities, right? My experience of my disability changed when I became a parent. Um, and I think the world experiences women with disabilities different than men and people of color are different than, so I think those identities intersect and impact people's perceptions. Um, and I think the other thing you asked Erin is, you know, what is, um, what is the biggest misconception? And I think at the root of it is that misunderstanding that in fact, people with disabilities want the same things as everybody else, right? That's really the unifying thing. Uh, the same right to the good life, right? And meaningful roles. And I think once people can recognize that shared humanity, things start to shift. Well, I, I thank you so much. And Manny, I'm really interested in your perspective on this question about the most common misconception people have about people with disabilities, but also feel free to talk about uh, to feed off of what Kate said regarding intersectionality or whatever else you'd like to share on on people's yeah. prejudices, basically. Yeah, sure. I think uh, I think one of the one of the misconceptions is that my disability or our disabilities are our greatest assets. Uh, to 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 particularly people will uh, look at us and assume that we can't do those things that are necessary, such as for employment, uh, to live independently, uh, et cetera. 
but to know that our disability is one of our greatest assets can clear up a lot of the a lot of the um a lot of the misunderstanding that we can bring something to the table. Uh not only, you know, talking about disabilities, but uh definitely uh continuing, you know, being African American and being a, a male. Uh, you know, when I go to apply for a job, you know, do I do I do I disclose that I have a disability or do I wait till later? So, you know, there's always that, that in the back of your mind, you know, if you don't get a phone call for an interview or et cetera. But I think what's going to happen or what needs to happen is that, you know, the United States needs to get to a place where we hire people instead of paper because I guarantee you all the jobs that I've had, if I got it in front of you for an interview, I'm going to leave everything on the table. And if you make a decision not to hire me, trust me, it won't be because of my disability. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different misconceptions, but I think when you talk about um, have, you know, has my work really cleared up some of those misconceptions, and I think I do that every day. You know, by waking up and going to work and being dedicated to the cause to show people we live in a we live in a show me country. You know, people want to see it, so we have to show people you know what we can what we can do. And you know, some some people um, some people say, well, I need the opportunity. I, I agree that we need the opportunity. But I also say that we must make the opportunities to show people what is possible. Thanks. And before I go to Max, I just wanted to add one thing from my own experience, if I could. And that is just so that the audience knows, is that um, I think as a result of those misconceptions or discomfort with disability, because people, when they look at me with somebody in a walker, are consider uh, looking at their own mortality, knowing that they may join me in a, the Walker Club at one point or another, but it causes them to say rather idiotic things despite their well intention. For example, uh, despite their good intentions rather, for example, one of my coworkers at another job told me, I never knew people with cerebral palsy could be smart until I met you. So I also think that that is part of the misconceptions that we have to tolerate a lot of well-meaning, but really inappropriate comments. But Max, am I off base or what do you think? Uh, do you, uh, do you uh, have an idea as to what the number one misconception is? And do you think you've changed hearts and minds? Um, well, a lot of it was um, uh, hit at uh, by um, um, Renee and uh, others on the uh, panel, but I'll just uh, kind of piggyback on that. Um, yeah, society's number one misconception about people with disabilities is that we are still seen as non-productive, not so smart, and just not capable of participating in as much in society. And people with disabilities are looked down on more than they are looked up to, more than looked up to. And society continues to send a strong message that we are not capable and we are uh, too slow. Um, my point is um, that ableism is alive and well within our society. And now um, your advocacy, my advocacy, our advocacy is helping change people's uh, perceptions of what it means to have a disability. Uh, but, but growing up in a world that often leaves out people with disabilities um, has stubbornly lasting effects. We have come a long way, but we got a long way to go. Um, in my life, when I connect with my peers, it helps me find my voice. And thank you for all of your efforts to support peers connecting with peers. And self-advocacy plays a unique and essential role in unlearning ableism. 
Um, and while joining self-advocacy, people with disabilities realize they are not alone and they meet others who have been through the same, if not similar challenges. Um, and because of that, uh, we help each other out while dealing with how society still looks down on us as a result um, of ableism. Thank you, Max. And before I get started, and Donna can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I believe if there's time today, we will have time for questions. And so many thoughts and questions are swirling in my, right, uh, my mind after listening to these four people that if you have questions for the panelists, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to it depending on time. But Max, I'm going to turn back to you. The ADA just turned 30 on July 26th. Yes. That's Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And where, as a person with a disability, where do you think the ADA has been successful, my friend? And where do you think it's fallen short? That's a really good question. Uh, yes, 30 years ago, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, did pass. Uh, happy birthday to that. Um, so 30 years ago, the ADA got rid of discrimination in employment. But today, only 20% um, of people with intellectual uh, disabilities uh, actually have jobs. I think developmental in there too. Um, I got my first job when I was still in high school and have worked ever since. Um, when I worked, when I work, it gives me confidence in myself. I'm taking care of myself and people see what I have to offer. I feel more responsible as a person Plus, I don't feel isolated. Uh, I am making a difference in the world, advocating for others. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act built um, uh, the legal foundation to close institutions and the sheltered workshops in Vermont and across the country. But let me be clear that our fight to end segregation continues. Um, basically, our message as people with disabilities is we want what you got. Um, marriage, uh, raising a family, jobs, oh, college, friends, respect, and just being loved. And we need to end all segregated settings completely. And more people with disabilities should be out there working. Well, I think that's a great point, Max, particularly about what you said about dating and marriage, because oftentimes I find people have a hard time believing that we as people with disabilities could be interested in those kind of things. But Renee, do you uh, have anything to add to what Max has said? Particularly, I'm interested because he did a good job of highlighting all the awesome aspects of the ADA, but where as a person with a disability do you think it's fallen short, that it's disappointed you? That is actually a really good question. And as Max said, only 20% of people with developmental, intellectual and developmental disabilities are employed. I think where it falls short is that a business's first thought is often time and cost. How much is it gonna cost us to be ADA compliant? How much time is it going to take for us to explain, re-explain something to you in a much more simpler way so you can understand and things like that. There needs, I believe there needs to be a better support and publicity showing just how much more beneficial it is to be ADA compliant and not just focus on the time or cost. If that's going to be your focus, then you are missing the point. Let's be realistic. As Max said, we want what everybody else has, jobs, the right to have a job, the right to get married, have a family, to be in a relationship. Everybody wants that. And if these people, if most people are still going to be set in their ways that, oh, you have a disability and we really don't want to take the time then you're missing out on something because it's true that I may need to go slower, but if I have more support, then I can able to be a contributor to society. We all are. We are hardworking, dedicated, 
we are true contributors to society too. And we need to be given the chance to show it. Thank you. And Kate, I, have, I just had a question for you. And it's the same one, but I wonder if, to begin with, if you agree with Renee's assertion that we need to do a better job in, and so does society in terms of public relations, uh, talking about how at, uh, people with disabilities are assets to businesses and society and not a drain on resources. I do, yes, uh, in short. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point, Renee. Uh, I think a lot of the misconception and contributing forces around uh, the low employment rates are the conception that it is somehow difficult or risky. Um, and I think the other contributing force, unfortunately, is that we don't fund supports in the way that we should. We don't pay DSPs the way we should. We don't um, spend sufficient federal and state dollars on Medicaid. Um, and I think those are costly forces for people with disabilities. I also think um, segregated education. I think Max mentioned ending all segregated environments. And I think we, we send very early and potent messages to young kids who will later be CEOs or HR professionals that um, people with disabilities belong elsewhere. And so I think that contributes. And I think the ADA did accomplish a ton regarding the physical space, right, and access. Um, and of course, Olmstead, the Olmstead decision, which was made under the ADA is a, a profound shift in our understanding about uh, people's rights to live in the community and outside of institutional settings. I think where it's fallen short is our ability to uphold the standards of implementation. And I think that's about the, the will and our work to advocate and, um, and, and probably capitalizing people with disabilities so that they have more power to make those changes. And Kate, I love wonking out with you, but not every person is on the call is going to know what a DSP is or Olmstead. Thank you for cueing me. So if, yeah. you, if you could just very briefly um, talk about what Olmstead is, what a DSP is, and what Medicaid is, because those are terms you mentioned, and I oh, live I did. Not everybody did. Does. Oh, that's, that's so important, Erin, and yet I feel like, what if I give a, a dicey definition? So I'll start with the easy one. DSP is dis uh, direct service professional. In my world, I think of that as a, a person who is helping me get up out of bed in the morning. Um, and that person is sometimes paid for with your money and it's sometimes paid for with um, Medicaid health insurance, which is public health insurance provided by federal and state money. And, um, and you might have what's called a waiver, right? That kind of waives the system's uh, expenditure of those monies in an institutional setting and says, instead, we will fund the help that you need to stay in your home. Um, what was the other? Olmstead. So Olmstead was a, a legal case that also recently has had an anniversary and went all the way to the Supreme Court, but originated in Georgia and, um, and was two women arguing their right to live in their own homes and not institutionalized. And attorneys right here uh, in Georgia fought for their right. And that Olmstead decision said that they should have that choice and that choices had in fact to be real. Um, and, and that happened under, under the provision of ADA. So, so we have ADA to thank for that. And indeed, as Max said, I think, and Renee said lots of work still to do. Manny, you, uh, yes, kudos to Lois Curtis. Um, Manny, you've heard a lot, but I know you have your own unique perspective on what the ADA has been successful at improving our lives, what aspects of our lives have been improved rather because of the ADA and where it's fallen short. Uh, and if you want to uh, follow up on anything that your fellow panelists have said, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, 
So, so speaking of speaking of the ADA, as someone who has grown up with the ADA and, and has always had it on my side, um, and in agreement with with everything that everyone has said, the ADA has done a lot of of great things as far as putting things into to law to make things a requirement. But what I what I believe needs to now happen. Now we need to focus on accountability. So now you know you have law, and now we need to make businesses and other entities um, uh, accountable when those things are not followed by uh, or or held up to. Um, there are a lot of businesses who who believe. Uh, you know, because they don't fully understand the ADA, that they don't have to do certain things. So I believe, you know, holding them accountable, but really, really teaching other individuals the the ins and outs of the ADA and how you can call your local uh, medical ADA center to to get um, to get uh, questions answered that you're not sure of, you know, having those toolkits to really hold uh, businesses and things accountable. One of the other, one of the other things that I think we also need to focus on is really, um, you know, protecting the ADA. We just, we just celebrated 30 years, you know, that took people before, you know, before uh, me to climb up the steps and, you know, fight to get this bill passed. Now you now you kind of, you know, pass the torch to the next uh, generation to, you know, I believe it was Justin Dark who said, uh, lead on. I, I could be wrong in that name, but now we have to, to lead on and really protect the next, uh, uh, you know, 30 years of the ADA and really be at the table uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, legislation, and not only on the local level, but national level. So if there's ever a conversation to open up the ADA and, and you know, relook at it, that we will be at the table. And that, again, that's why I believe it's important for us as people who believe in the movement, not necessarily just people with disabilities, but people who believe in the movement to not be afraid to um, to be at the table and to call your you know lo local representatives and you know and I know most people some people are going to say well everybody's not comfortable with doing that and that might be true but I think what one must happen is until someone is comfortable you must believe in them enough. And so they are comfortable to to carry on their own advocacy world. You know, as I mentioned in the very beginning, if it was you missed them. Summarize, I, I could listen to you all day, but if you could please summarize, Manny, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so basically, in summary, uh, really, really, um, you know, as I said, the ADA has done great things, but we must protect the next 30 years to to grow the ADA to really be that uh, Civil Rights Act that it was supposed to be. Okay, I think that's really great. And I think that it answers the question of our friend from Guam about, well, what if people aren't comfortable? And uh, I think that you answered it well when you said we have to help them until they're comfortable. Um, but I want, it's really, my friends, the season to pop out the bubbly because in addition to the 30th anniversary, of the ADA, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of DD councils be, being included in what we call uh, the DD Act now. And as you know, the law stipulates that DD councils must uh, support self advocacy in their state or territory. And so, uh, what I wanted to hear is how have councils in your experience supported self advocacy? How has it changed over the years, colleagues? And 
what more can we do? Because there's always more to do. And we will begin this question with uh, Manny again. Uh, I believe I've heard you correctly. You were breaking up a little bit on my end. Um, and I believe the question was in regards to uh, DD councils and advocacy. Is that correct? Yes, I said that it was really the season to uh, take out the bubbly because the DD Act, uh, or 50 years ago, DD councils were included in the DD Act. And my question was, what do you think councils have done for self-advocacy? How has it changed over the years? And what more can councils do? Uh, sure, real briefly. Uh, the the uh, partners in policy making uh, program for me was real crucial in my life doing a whole 180. Uh, so I've been programs like partners in policy making. But, uh, but in addition to that, uh, the the director of each council plays such a crucial part, not only the, the council members, but it really takes a good director to to help uh, facilitate and to direct, um, you know, help the council fulfill their uh, five-year state plan. You know, I was, a, I was a council member for a year uh, before I became employed uh, with the council. And now that I'm employed, I kind of get the best of both worlds because I understand both sides, but it really takes, you know, now that I'm employed, it really takes a good director to see where my strengths are. And that's why it's important to to really uh, have an open mind director where they can look at those strengths and to realize that a person with a disability can be their greatest asset. You know, regardless of how big the the uh, policy manual is, how big the annual report is, it's really about those people sitting at the table. So really raising up some advocates to to lead their own uh, discussion, you know, and, and meetings. And, uh, you know, partners did that. And we, I know in Delaware, I can speak for Delaware, we really believe in giving self-advocates the space and, not only space, but give them the tools to to bring those ideas and to, to be the next leaders of not only tomorrow, but today. Because we must start now in order to protect the future for the United States of America. Okay, Kate, thanks, Manny. You are always, you always are so insightful. Kate, you like Manny, happen to be a person with a disability, but you make your living working at a DD council in a senior position. So I'm really interested in your answer to this question. Thanks. I feel like I'm learning so much uh, listening to the other panelists. So thank you all. Um, in Georgia, we have made some recent shifts to the way that we approach supporting self-advocacy. So I can only speak to kind of the last five or 10 years here. Um, the council had a long relationship with the People First chapters and the state organization here. And, um, and what we noticed is that is something that somebody put in the comments there, that we weren't growing in numbers. We had a, a wonderful, strong, and still do um, collection of very seasoned expert advocates. And, um, but not a lot of newcomers, not a lot of young people. And so we initiated some work around the state um, to fund new grassroots self-advocacy uh, kind of coalitions with support. And they have since become uh, the Uniting for Change group. And uh, they've relied on work by Beth Mount to explore their priorities and their strengths and the needs of their local communities, as well as the the way they want to operate as a collective at the state level. And, and they've been able to work in concert with state agencies, with policymakers, with People First, with ADAPT. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, the other thing that we've done is recognize that some folks will become super advocates with mentorship and that um, that might warrant a unique focused effort. And so we funded 
some projects around mentoring young developing advocates so that they can really uh, take a place in the state um, and, and nationally if they want um, of, of having an identity as an advocate around issues that are of most importance to Thank that. You. So I think that's the way to go at it. Yeah. Thank you and uh, very much. And Renee, do you have thoughts on this question about the anniversary, what DD councils uh, have done in self-advocacy and what they could do differently? Uh, just to share us your thoughts from the land of love. You're on mute, Renee. I know, sorry, I couldn't find my picture. Um, so in answer to your question, I completely agree with what Manny said earlier. The director is crucial to the success of the mission of self-advocacy support. Our DD councils strive to make sure our voices are heard and fully embraces nothing about us without us. They support the full participation of self-advocates in activities, meetings, and events as equal partners, just like Manny said. I believe the council sees our potential and supports us to become leaders, not only at the DD council table, but fully integrated into our community for everything, job, employment. Uh, the council started off, is there more, uh, has a change, is there more we can do? I think we could start early to teach advocacy and leadership skills to younger people. We need more leaders in decision-making positions. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Renee, I really appreciate that. And I, I agree with you that there needs to be more of us at the decision-making tables in this country. Max, I'm gonna finish it up with you, but uh, this, this question seems tailor designed for you, my friend. Well, I think honestly, um, when, you know, when we look at the 50 years, um, of the DD councils existing, um, anything that, you know, they've done, you know, tremendously well and anything that, you know, could use some improvement. I want to start out with the, um, what they've done well. Um, they take us seriously, um, up here, the DD council, we work with are good role models for, uh, for other disability programs. Uh, they demonstrate how to create um, a true, true collaborations uh, with self-advocacy organizations uh, where we feel like equal partners and it is a good team effort. Um, they use their power to and influence uh, to shine a light on our leaders and self-advocacy, in self-advocacy. Um, our relationship um, with the DD Council um, as our allies uh, has deepened over the years. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, we recommend uh, and a reviewed focus on supported uh, local uh, supporting of our local groups. Um, now more than ever, we need to strengthen uh, the grassroots, the heart and soul of the self-advocacy movement and uh, the value of peer-to-peer -peer connections has become even more obvious during uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, many of us uh, are without services and we are tuning to each, uh, turning to each other um, uh, for support and we are surrounded by uh, ever-changing and complicated information. Um, we need our uh, self-advocacy meetings to be a safe place where we can go virtually to get uh, information we can understand. Uh, throughout the pandemic, my local and state um, advocacy group has worked uh, closely with our Vermont DD Council. Also, I want to give a shout out of appreciation to the um, NACDD for being so willing to share information about um, Zoom meetings for self-advocates, um, and we are very grateful to uh, the DD councils in California, New York, and Texas. Um, when we created booklets about COVID-19, they immediately helped out by translating them into 11 different languages. 
Um, so the way I see it is this, DD councils are being masters of the self-advocacy dance. Um, by that, I mean stepping up and stepping back, stepping up to make sure we are um, invited and included in important policy decisions, stepping up to provide resources when we need them. And now, of course, stepping back, um, meaning withholding judgment and putting um, yourself in our shoes. And um, for stepping back, it also means creating the space for us to, uh, you know, just us to be all we can be. Thank you, Max. Thank you very, very much. That was awesome. Um, I'm going to start on this next question with Kate Brady, because in her state of Georgia, uh, she has two competitive Senate races, and Georgia will be competitive on the presidential level. So what do you think, Kate, uh, given that uh, you live in a state that's going to have a major say in picking our next president in the next less than 100 days from now, uh, DD councils can do to make sure that everyone has access to vote, can vote, and uh, has their needs met so that they can exercise one of their most sacred rights as a citizen. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I'm gonna be quick. I think, number one, register early, vote early. Um, number two, yeah, it is. It's uh, uh, such a critical election. I think councils should partner in all ways possible. Um, I think getting out the vote is work that uh, many communities are focused on. And I think we can create allies by recognizing that access issues span some of our issues, right? Poverty, transportation, uh, literacy, access to IDs. Um, and so I think partnership is key on this. And, uh, and then I think thinking strategically about where, how we can anticipate where issues are going to arise at polling places or with uh, absentee ballots or with um, the machines themselves, right? There's been a huge fight in Georgia about the change in machines. And then I think at the individual level, it's about making a commitment to do more than just vote yourself, right? And, and be sure that you're engaged on election day and as much as you can beforehand in supporting others. Thank you. And Manny, you have an interesting state too because Senator Coons is up for re-election in November as is, and I believe uh, obviously a member of Congress because uh, every two years House members are included. Uh, that, uh, so Ms. Blunt Rochester will be running again for re-election. So I'm just wondering, Manny, and uh, uh, if you have any thoughts, and feel free, guys, if you don't have anything else to say, just say, that was great, uh, I'll pass, but I want to make sure everybody's voice is heard. So as a Delawarean, uh, what do you think council should do, given that you work for one? Uh, great question, great question. But I think one of the one of the most important and valuable things is that council can do is to really share information, make people uh, with disabilities and without uh, disabilities aware uh, access to to voting is so crucial, and especially given the circumstances that we are in now with the pandemic. Uh, really making people aware of the options of of um, uh, absentee ballots, uh, you know, how, uh, how they can register from home, and, and really the the access is so crucial. You know, not only with a, a person with a disability, but uh, even as uh, even as an African American, to have the right to vote is so crucial. So. I agree. I agree that, you know, this can be a time for partnerships, especially here in Delaware. We are people, you know, we're a, we're a small state, but we're so crucial to everyone getting out and voting. I, I, I know that one of the things here in my state, we 
are trying to uh, release information in the form of videos and uh, other avenues to make people with disabilities aware and be not only aware about voting, but the benefits of voting. You know, being able to vote is so beneficial to uh, to legislation for the next couple of years and how we can build those friendships now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Thank you very much. And uh, if you're not talking, if you could please mute because it's distracting. Uh, Renee or Max, do you have anything to add? Um, it's about voting, correct? Yes, just if you have anything to add about how councils can make sure that get the word out that it's important to vote and make sure that everyone has access. Um, I could go. Um, so my answer to that is what we do is we give self-advocates and people with disabilities information in plain language. In other words, in a way that is accessible for them to understand. Um, we give direct information to self-advocates that is unbiased um, about uh, voting. Um, we also, we, we have always made it clear that we do not tell people who to vote for and what party they should support. Our job is to um, make sure people have accurate information to make sure a decision about who they want to vote for. Um, pretty much for them to help with um, who they want to vote for. Um, in a way that is accessible and understandable. Thank um, you. Now, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I just want to see, because uh, we're running a little short, if Renee has anything that she wanted to add. If not, um, we'll move to the next question. But I wanted to end with a question of my own that I think will really synthesize everything. Hey, Donna? Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, my answer is that to this question is I recently had the opportunity to work on a public service announcement with Hawaii Kids Now on a how-to video on voting for home, on voting from home. This has been published on several websites if you are interested. I think my PSA announcement says it best on the website. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, I got a copy of the video. I've just been so busy at work. I was bummed I didn't get a chance to look at it before, but Donna sent it to me and I look forward to watching it. And uh, I think I'm going to combine the next two questions and uh, then we can uh, take us home. Uh, and a special hello to my friend, um, a special hello to my friend, Rachel Nandan. I My two questions that I'm combining is, can you tell me please uh, how you think COVID-19 has impacted um, self-advocacy? And uh, also, you know, what have you learned from having to work home from, uh, having to work from home since March? And also just as a final thought, um, this will be the final question. Uh, the ADA is 30 now. So uh, think in your final statement about wh uh, what do you hope has changed for the ADA in 30 years when the ADA turns 60. So we will start uh, with Renee Manfredi to take us home initially. Um, if I have learned one thing it's that when everyone is stuck in with the same situation and challenge, solutions are quickly created. The we can't becomes we can. What I, to me, it has leveled the playing field. This pandemic has leveled the playing field of interacting. What was once only able to happen in person or face to face can still happen just virtually like what we're doing now. This has proven we can meet individuals where they are. I think COVID has opened doors that everyone said, no, we can't to now they have to. I feel that in many ways, everyone is experiencing my life and the lives of so many with IDD. 
So many are trapped at home and are alone except for that one outing. However, I've seen many advocates lack these simple computer skills or they are not available to them. And I believe this time has demonstrated the importance that all advocates need to have sufficient technology skills. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I truly appreciate that, Renee. And uh, it has been an honor to be with you the last hour. Thanks for getting up early for, for NACED. Now we will go to Kate Brody, uh, and she will talk about um, the COVID question. And maybe if she wants to, any thoughts about what she hopes has changed for people with disabilities uh, when the ADA turns 60, 30 years from now? All right, taking them in reverse, Erin. In 30 years, I sure do hope we're not spending money in any segregated settings any longer. And um, in the interest of time, I'll just go with that. Uh, in terms of COVID, I love Renee's point about this, the pandemic is the great leveler, right? It, it is something we're all experiencing and, uh, and has brought what is the quintessential, unfortunately, uh, common disability experience to the homes of so many. I do think in as much as we could have possibly, we are adapting quickly. Um, I've seen whole systems turned on their heads and I think um, people still have countless unmet needs, but I do think we are being nimble and uh, I hate to keep echoing brilliant Renee, but the truth is that digital divide is the thing that no amount of nimbleness solves unless we really put our minds to that in particular. Um, so I think we're really called to, to attend to that during this time. Thank you. I, I, I share Renee's concern and your concern about lack of computer literacy on the part of people with disabilities. Thank you so much for being with us today, Kate. You've added a great deal to the discussion. And I'll get to say I knew you when. Um, Manny, Manny Jenkins, um, for your final time, what, what do you uh, t share with us your thoughts on COVID and maybe what you hope has changed for people with disabilities in 30 years? Uh, to echo what everyone has said so far, COVID-19 has, uh, has become the, the, um, the level of playing field. However, uh, COVID-19 has all, uh, also shown us that we are able to reach people that we typically wouldn't be able to reach. So there is a, there is a, um, there is a lack of technology, but for those that have technology, it has allowed us uh, to reach people that we normally wouldn't be able to reach. So now, you know, one of our one of our focuses is to put technology in the hands of people with disabilities, so they can they can become advocates, they can become uh, council members. For uh, real quick, you know, when when COVID started, before COVID started, we had we would struggle with uh, reaching quorum. However, you know, once COVID started. We now have not had an issue with having quorum for meetings. So now, you know, as a council, our, our, one of our one of our big things is to put that technology in the hands of people uh, with disabilities for medical reasons and advocacy reasons uh, to be able to continue the work that we have done. But I do agree that it has become, you know, things that we couldn't do before. Everybody's like. Well, here it is. Let's do it for everybody. So unfortunately, it took a pandemic to do that. But there is a silver lining that we're able to reach people that we typically wouldn't be able to reach. OK, and Max Burroughs. And then I have one statement, and that will conclude the session. All right, so I have to say all of this. Um, so we still, about COVID-19, we still find ourselves fighting battles we thought we already won. We are working with the DD Council to make sure hospital policies do not discriminate against people with disabilities, sometimes approaching individual hospitals to assist that 
uh, insist that we do not be put in the back of the line when it comes to uh, uh, getting uh, the treatment that we need. Um, I think it's really important to connect on a Zoom to and have regular scheduled meetings that uh, uh, self-advocates can connect on. Also, self-advocates have been bombarded with information that has been difficult to process. And during Zoom meetings, uh, we can take as much time as we need to discuss information using plain language. And when people with disabilities in New York were refused to have a support person uh, with them, when in the hospital, advocates met online to challenge the decision and get access. Um, and then po once policies were changed, we used our virtual meetings to uh, get out the word across the country uh, by meeting with peer leaders from more than 30 states. And we talked about and created advocacy tools for how to speak up about our rights to have a supporter with us when getting medical treatment. And when communities started reopening and providers uh, were not allowed when people with disabilities see their families or go back to work, um, 60 peer leaders, 60 plus peer leaders from across the country have a, had a Zoom meeting with lawyers from protection and advocacy. And we again worked with, uh, together uh, to create advocacy tools so people know their rights. Is it perfect? No. As we are reaching most people, um, absolute, are we reaching most people? Absolutely not. But we are working on it. And since mid-March, we have stayed connected during this time of uncertainty, holding two meetings a uh, week with Zoom. And on a national level, um, state and even local level, uh, self-advocates have gotten comfortable with meeting virtually using uh, Zoom, but it is important uh, to get back to meeting in person once the pandemic calms down and it's safe enough to do so. I say this because not everyone has a device or access to the internet. Also, there are many people who have limited speech. During COVID-19, they have not, they, have not had access to the support to communicate due to lack of services. But for all those who have access, it gives self-advocates a chance to talk uh, about concerns they have about uh, where things are going. For example, in Vermont, most of our local self-advocacy groups have been meeting virtually um, and uh, still uh, have their meetings. And we here back in Vermont have been putting together information about COVID-19 in plain language since the pandemic began. And that way self-advocates can understand what is and how to stay safe in the simplest ways. Uh, so we have to make booklets and glossaries uh, to that break down what's uh, going on and focused on um, and focus on the need to know instead of the nice to know. And it is important uh, to focus on the need to know information rather than the nice to know information when discussing COVID-19. And all of this I have learned through conducting Zoom meetings throughout the country and state with self advocates. Um, and just in terms of like the ADA 30 years from now, I wanna see a world in a country where everybody is free from ableism. Ableism is unlearned, no more segregation. Everyone is included to the fullest because when everybody works together, it's a win-win situation and it's a win-win outcome. So thanks for listening. I think that was the perfect end to the session. I just wanna say how uplifting this past hour has been. And I just wanna end with one of my favorite quotes. After listening to this hour, my feet are tired, but my soul is inspired. So I turn it back to my dear friend, Donna Meltzer to close us out. Erin, thank you so much. I, I could not agree with those sentiments more. I think I have learned so much today. Um, I personally have taken copious notes on so many of the amazing things that each of you as panelists shared. I wanna thank you, Max, Kate, Emmanuel, and Renee for sharing so much of yourselves and your opinions and your work. Um, as, a, as the leader of NACDD, Max, something you said made me feel so proud. I, I had to write this quote of yours down. DD councils are masters of the self-advocacy dance. Wow, beautifully said, and that just makes me feel so good about all of the work that we come together to do um, to lift up that mandate that is in the DD Act and to make sure that everybody, every advocate has that opportunity to be 
um, an advocate for themselves, for others, and for systems change. That is at our heart and soul of DD Councils. Um, Aaron Kaufman, I want to thank you for doing a fabulous job as our moderator today. I really appreciate that you took the time to do this and, and you're just so great at this role. I want to thank everybody who attended today. Um, I hope this was a valuable session to you. I know that all of our panelists are available if anybody wants to reach out to any of these fine folks um, independently for more thoughts or ideas about how they became an advocate, what they do to advocate. I know that they're all open to talking with you. Um, and again, to everybody, just thank you for making this a great kickoff to our NACDD annual conference this year. Again, congratulations to our award winners uh, who we heard from earlier today. I'm so proud of all of you and all of your work. Um, thank you to the NACDD team for getting this uh, organized and thank you for dealing with any little glitches that we had today using our technology. I wish everybody a great rest of your day. Thank you again for joining us and we will see you all soon. Take care. See ya. See ya. I think Katie, Emmanuel and uh, Renee, I think we should get together like in the future. And I just wanna say Renee, Hawaii is on my list of uh, destinations for vacations. Anyway. <laughs>